32 years ago, it would have been unimaginable. Two Democratic presidential contenders, one a woman, another an African American, courting black voters in Alabama, preaching to overflowing churches. Are you ready to march? Every year, there's a commemoration of Selma, a great encounter between the forces of the civil rights movement led by John Lewis and others, and police with truncheons. And Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama want to make an impression in Selma. Many black voters say they're torn between voting for the African-American Obama or sticking with the Clintons who've supported civil rights for years. That's the agonizing choice for John Lewis, bludgeoned during the Selma march and now a congressman. It was tough. It was very, it was tough. I supported uh, President Clinton and I got to know Hillary. It was one of the tough decisions of my political life. The Clintons felt that they had deep inroads with the African-American community, and with, with reason. You remember in, the, in a certain New Yorker magazine, Toni Morrison wrote that Bill Clinton was the first black president. Said with some irony, said with all kinds of, uh, but mostly with admiration, too. Obama gives his speech at Brown Church, and Hillary is down the street in another church. Yes, that long march to freedom that began here has carried us a mighty long way. It's, it's a contest. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, giving all praise and honor to God. Yeah. Bringing us here today. I just want to talk a little bit about Moses and Aaron and Joshua. Because we are in the presence today of a lot of Moses. We're in the presence today of giants whose shoulders we stand on. He begins paying tribute to what he calls the Moses generation. Who's Moses? Martin Luther King did not see. Famously says in his speech, I might not get there with you. As great as Moses was, despite all that he did, leading a people out of bondage, he didn't cross over the river to see the promised land. God told him, your job is done. We're going to leave it to the Joshua generation to make sure it happens. There's still some battles that need to be fought, some rivers that need to be crossed. Obama pronounces himself the head of the Joshua generation. That's incredibly nervy. Moses told the Joshua generation, don't forget where you came from. And I worry sometimes that the Joshua generation in its success forgets where it came from. Thinks it doesn't have to make as many sacrifices. Do you think people in the 1940s, 1950s woke up and said, we are the civil rights generation, let's do this, as though it was, you know, fantastic? Our nostalgia has made us look back at that period of time as though it was great. But it was not great getting hit in the head on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. These weren't fun times. These were times of commitment when people decided that they weren't going to take it anymore and that they could make this country better. Folks complaining about the quality of our government, I understand there's something to be complaining about. I'm in Washington. I see what's going on means we can't sit out elections. It means we can't just vote for people and then not show up to hold them accountable. It means we can't think that government is something other people do. But I tell you what, I also know that if Cousin Pookie would vote, <laughs> if, if Uncle Jethro would get off the couch and stop watching Sports Center and go register some folks and go to the polls, we might have a different kind of politics. That's what the Moses generation teaches us. Kick off your bedroom slippers, put on your marching shoes. Go do some politics. Change this country. That's what they teach. To me, that event 
is as much his declaration to run for president as his announcement speech in Springfield, but it's made particular to the black community.